Well, good morning, everybody. It is nine o'clock, so I guess we better get started then. All right. Hope everybody had a good night. Welcome to the second session of the 2021 Oklahoma Recycling Conference, keeping a lid on contamination. I want to give a shout out to Fit and Rude for hosting the social hour last night. It was a blast. I learned some things. I did. I did learn some things. Today, the focus is on contamination. This is an issue that plagues all of us. We know that from talk conversations yesterday. I just can't wait to uh, hear what our speakers have to say. First, we're going to start the afternoon. Well, the morning, obviously. <laughs> I got distracted from yesterday. Zach Benedict is chair of the Oak Rip Materials Exchange Work Group. Zach is going to talk about opportunities to get rid of something to someone who wants it. One man's trash is another man's treasure, right? Even larger amounts of something. Zach, take it away, please. Hi, good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? I hope so, okay. So, um, you know, I think we actually might have a couple of questions that pop up on the screen soon, um, if that works well with the polling. Um, there we go. So if everybody will kind of give me an idea of who all knows about materials exchange, um, who might not. And so, you know, I am, I'm, I'm the uh, work group chair for um, materials exchange at Okra. We are, uh, have taken an interest in helping not just the consumer um, figure out how to recycle their, um, you know, their items, but also industries and businesses and even government agencies and things like that that might have waste. And so these are um, good opportunities and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that we can look at a couple of these slides I've got. Okay, so that's good. There's a lot of people that are familiar with uh, materials exchange, that's good. And that's what this is about. This is a overview. I hope you can see my screen. Um, and so materials exchange programs exist really to connect businesses that have unwanted materials with businesses that want materials, uh, want those materials. Um, it, people have described it as kind of like a dating website for businesses. It could also be thought of like Facebook marketplace for businesses. It, it you know, like you said, one man's trash, another man's treasure, same with businesses. And so um, there's a lot of benefits to these, um, th these programs, if it's not already being used. And, you know, I hope for those business owners that might be out there or people who um, kind of call the shots in certain businesses, or if you know somebody who, who has that relationship with a business that can, that can implement these into their businesses, I hope this kind of, uh, you take away something from this. And so some benefits, uh, would it be there's, there's environmental benefits this reduces uh, resource extraction so this is your raw materials that might be needed to make your products so this could be wood oil you know metals things like that uh, uh, things like that that can be uh, needed to make products well this is a good solution to reduce the need for for that and environmental destruction and things like that to get those resources. Um, it also reduces waste and pollution because obviously if you're able to reuse or recycle materials that you have to go somewhere else, it doesn't end up in landfill. It doesn't end up even possibly in recycling facilities that can't take whatever it is you're trying to recycle. Unfortunately, not all of them can take those things. And so this is a good way to find a um, alternative solution to that. Um, financial benefits include lowering disposal costs, uh, especially if sometimes if there's like hazardous um, disposal costs, it's, it's a good solution to find somebody who can take that off your hands rather than having to pay for somebody to uh, come and dispose it for you. And, um, and that can, can help with expenses. And so it also can increase revenue. So you, instead of A, having to pay for disposal costs, you can instead actually sell these unwanted materials. These could be byproducts or anything like that, um, that you can then increase your revenue from something that you previously weren't even making any money from. 
and it also could just lower your overall expenses. Yes, from the disposal cost, but also because you're not having to dig up those raw materials that are needed. They're already they're already available to you. Um, this next slide here. So so you know that's materials exchange in a nutshell in general. But we do have something that we want to promote uh, through Okra, and it's called Renew. Um, and it's the call it's, it stands for the resource exchange network for eliminating waste acronym renew um, and it is a pro materials exchange program that includes oklahoma within its region it's this there's a region uh, with the epa called um, region six and that includes oklahoma texas new mexico arkansas and louisiana kind of the south central region of the u.s and um Renew is a website that allows us to go on and find regional people either who are wanting to get rid of uh, certain materials and uh, make sure it gets a, bit, a new use to it. Or if you are in need of materials, you can always go on there and see if anybody's got them already posted. So I've got kind of a couple arrows here to just say, all you really have to do, and I'll, I think I'm gonna try to do a quick walkthrough if I've got time. <clears throat> There's, uh, you go to, to renewtx.net. Um, the logo says .org. That both will get you there. .org is like a separate website that you have to do one more click to get to .net. But so I would just go straight to the source .net. Um, you can create a profile so that you can post your materials, uh, either materials that you have available or materials that you want. Um, you don't have to create a profile to do the browsing or to uh, just kind of get a hang for the website. But um, if you want to post anything, you do have to create a profile and then you can manage that posting you've made and get in contact with people that, um, that you can connect with other businesses and things like that. So there are current materials on there and these include um, acids, solvents, oil, plastic, paper, textiles, wood, metal, rubber, glass, paints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just all sorts of, uh, sometimes the most random things you could think of. Thankfully, there's people out there that are wanting to say, that they might be currently disposing of them, but they're, they're hoping that there's a taker out there that can take these off their hands and put them to good use um, rather than filling the landfills and things like that. Um, there, you know, let me go to, the website because kind of speaking of those benefits I mentioned earlier, Renew specifically has been around since the late 80s. Um, and um, it kind of just expanded about 10, 15 years ago to include the region. Renew was at one point just Texas and that's why it's got that tx.net. But um, uh, now it's regional and it's been expanded. And since then, um, you know, they uh, have had a lot of success. Um, let me look here. It says here that they've had 499 exchanges uh, it, during that time with over 1 billion pounds of material uh, for reuse uh, or recycling. And this has saved facilities more than $27 million in disposal costs. So like I said, reducing your expenses and costs. Um, and it's helped um, earning close to uh, $15 million uh, from selling these things. Again, these are items that previously wouldn't have even been making any money off of because you're actually paying to have them disposed uh, in many cases. And now you're now businesses are able to make some money off of these, these uh, materials and byproducts. And so if I have just a couple minutes here, if you guys can see my screen, this is just what the homepage looks like. Um, it really lists out here materials available and, and materials wanted. They're really much of the same. Um, and up here, so you can log in. Like I said, once you've created a profile, you can log in, but you don't have to do that to so just go on and, and take a look. Uh, you got you know materials available and materials wanted and on the available, uh, somebody must have just posted an uh, electric motor and uh, aluminum alloy wheels and things like that. And you'll notice, so somebody came in from Florida and actually put some stuff in here. So it goes beyond regional. You're going to find a lot of stuff regional, but somebody in Florida just posted a bunch of stuff. Um, and that's, you know, power to them. That's good. Hopefully we can find some takers here that, that can uh, get those. Um, and the materials wanted here in Texas, different things. Uh, 
and and they're hoping that regionally they can find some people that can supply them with these and so um you know i encourage everybody to um to do this you know to check this out um and see if you know see if this could be a good fit for your business uh if you're not a business owner maybe you know somebody who is and um and hopefully kind of make a good difference uh for the environment but also that company financially does anybody have any questions for me zach i was uh checking the the chats to see uh sarah was talking about success stories she said that uh, she knew indeed of a company that was retiring leather tool belts and found a company in Texas that could use them. Um, and I thought that was great. Uh, if, if I do not know as much about this and I'm, I'm gonna be watching your page. I am, I know some folks that could benefit from this. Good, good, yeah, I appreciate that. Um... Hey, oh, I do have a, there is a question come in, forgive me. Have the, has the state of Oklahoma any policy supporting materials exchange? You know, that's a good question. Um, I'm unfamiliar with any specifics that are coming out of, you know, the state of Oklahoma. Now we do have the Department of Environmental Quality, the DEQ, that is helping promote this as well. So we do have some state, um, um, you know, agencies that are, are trying to promote this in conjunction with the their Texas counterpart, uh, the TCEQ and things like that to get the word out that this is out here. This is a good alternative solution. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully get some, get some, gain some steam on this so that uh, we can get more postings on there. Very cool. Um, that was followed up with, if the state doesn't have any policies, how uh, the citizens of Oklahoma can help implement this policy. Is that something that you all are looking into? Yeah, we certainly can. As a group, we can uh, certainly, you know, um, my hope is to work with, uh, just we got a new contact at the DEQ that's going to be taking this up as well that, we, that I, we can work closely with to try to implement some policies that could create some incentive uh, to do this for businesses. So that's the hope. Um, citizens in general can make sure that the people that they know who own these who own businesses and might have it, it could be agricultural it could be manufacturing it could be anything like that that there's naturally going to be some byproducts or there's naturally going to be leftover waste from making products and things like that these can all be posted on there it might not be picked up immediately but and and so you might continue to have to find ways to dispose of them or recycle them but um you know the hope is that eventually there's, there's somebody in the region that can make a connection and, and, um, and really, you know, renew is not going to be, it's not transactional. It's not, there's no, like, you don't put your credit card in there and, and buy these things. It just puts you in contact with another business. So you, it's between you and the other business, how you want to set up that payment, that transportation uh, and things like that. And so it's, just, just, a neat, it, it's just a neat alternative. Uh, there was one more, forgive me, Zach. Um, uh, Michael Patton asked, what's the most unusual thing you've seen on the, uh, materials exchange program. Uh, and uh, Ellen said airplane seats. Have you seen anything else? Ellen said what now? Airplane seats. Airplane seats? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I just thought when I was um, going down is, is uh, somebody's just getting rid of broken concrete and, um, you know, just they're, they're, they're making the best out of anything that they can uh, that, um, they think can be put to better use. And, and I, I think that there's a lot of, a lot of respect for that. And, um, you know, the airplane seats is another example, somebody, or, uh, or the, just the engine motor we saw earlier. I just think that these are items that, um, you know, hopefully can get put to better use because there's a lot of places that can't take these for recycling even. And so they're just going to end up in a landfill if they don't get, get used by somebody else. Exactly. Uh, a follow-up on the uh, the uh, policy concerns and questions. Uh, Ellen was asking, is anyone in the DEQ listening this morning? I know there are. Uh, there are DEQ folks. Can you speak to policies for the state of Oklahoma concerning this? Nobody, nobody on that right now. I've, I've got a, I've got um, a contact at DEQ that I don't think is on this call who is going to be heading this up. Um, uh, just kind of switched hands a little bit, and so. 
I would be more than happy to get their input. And, and we actually, in the last newsletter, just put in a uh, article for Materials Exchange. I think it would be great to follow up that article with what we're doing in partnership with the DEQ uh, and under um, the new leadership for that Renew is going to be seeing uh, from an Oklahoma standpoint. So I can certainly get their input and um, and and kind of fill everybody in with what the DEQ is doing as well. Zach, thank you, thank you, yep. and really appreciate this. Uh, obviously, it was an interesting uh, start to our morning. We enjoyed that and encourage you to join in and uh, be a part of that vision uh, with us, uh, Okra, and with uh, Renew. I appreciate it. Thanks. Our uh, our next speaker, Vincent Larray, is the Grant Development Manager with the Recycling Partnership. Vincent has helped countless communities deal with contamination. Let's listen to what Vincent has to say about the Recycling Partnership's very successful Feet on the Street program. Vincent? Uh, hello, everyone. I want to make sure that screen is, my screen's coming through okay. All right. Well, good morning, folks. So thankful to be with y'all. Um, and uh, as mentioned, I'm with the Recycling Partnership. Very proud to be here. And I'll be talking to y'all about our Feet on the Street work. So um, here's my contact information, obviously. And I think I'll just dive right in because I've got a lot of content for y'all. I'm going to move fast because I really want to walk you through it, but you'll have this uh, slide deck afterward. So um, please refer to it as you need and contact me anytime with any questions. And with that, I'll jump in. So here's what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> the uh, quick introduction to the recycling, excuse me, to the recycling partnership in case y'all haven't heard of us. Uh, I'll let you know what is the feed on the street. Um, how, how do you approach it? How do you get there? What are some results that you can maybe hope to expect? And then just some additional resources um, so that y'all can have these at your disposal. We may not go through all those depending on time, but they'll be there for you if you need to access this deck later. And so uh, who we are, um, we're a national nonprofit that means to sort of elevate uh, residential recycling um, across the country. Um, with our different programs, whether they're grants, technical assistance, things like this, uh, we've directly reached uh, about 60% of the U.S. population. We're very proud of that number. Um, here's a quick couple of stats for you. Uh, we've placed over a million new recycling carts, uh, curbside carts in different communities. Um, we've seen 51% you know, recycling boost in those communities. We have kept over 230 million pounds of recyclables out of the landfills. So um, just to say that we are a small organization, but we have a pretty big ambitions. Uh, here is just some of the projects we've done all across the country. You'll see we've got a couple in Oklahoma. Um, as mentioned, I'm a grants development manager, so I would love to get more projects in Oklahoma. So um, let me know if you've got some thoughts and ideas, if you're thinking about curbside particularly. And uh, our perspective is that, you know, recycling is, it's a, it's a systems approach. That's what we need. Um, you see everyone on this, on this page touches recycling, works in recycling, impacts recycling. And so what we do is we try to work with everyone to kind of raise the game uh, for the whole system. And so as you know, we do like to thank our sponsors and funders. You'll see folks from brands all through the value chain, from processors to haulers to the EPA to brand, uh, I already said brands to you know, just recycling firms themselves to tech firms sometimes. So just to say that we work across materials, across the supply chain, across the value chain. Um, we're a pre-competitive organization. And so, and uh, this is just a really important slide that I really like to, to lead off with. Um, and so we did some, um, we did some work and some polling and we found that 84% of the United States residents feel that recycling is as valuable a public service as waste and water. And um, upwards of 75% of US residents are willing to pay more for it. Now, how much they're willing to pay is an open question. But so as you're thinking about your program, just be confident that, that your citizens and your communities really, really value recycling. So what is Speed on the Street? Uh, it is a systematic approach to provide curbside feedback to improve recycling. Uh, and it is first and foremost, an education campaign. Uh, you have for your communities to recycle well, they have to have the infrastructure, they have to have access, 
and then they have to know how to do it. So this is all about education, education first. You're going to hear that a lot. Uh, so um, one, two, an important way to think about contamination is that it's either the wrong material in the system or the right material prepared the wrong way. Um, and so that presents kind of a twin challenge here. You can either have trash in your recycling or you're recycling in the trash. And so those are actually two different issues. Those are two different behaviors. So what we're gonna really focus on is trash in your recyclables. But you know, there is a there is a level of education that's needed to help get your recyclables out of the trash too. Beat on the street approaches both of those a little bit, but it really focuses on your trash in the recyclables. So this is what we want. We all know at the end of the day, recycling is to keep material out of landfill and you know into the circular economy. Effectively, what a MRF does, it provides feedstock to manufacturers. So we want these nice clean bales. We don't want these trashy bales, and we don't want food waste and nastiness. So um, again, we're talking about education. Um, so three kind of ways to improve your quality is to kind of inform your, and you need to inform your residents and you need to trigger a behavior. You know, they need to do something in response to your education. You wanna personalize that feedback. You want your feedback to be relevant to that behavior that you're trying to get them to trigger. And then you wanna issue specific communications. Um, so what our, you know, this is just an example of some of our standard feed on the street. We have info cards, we have tags and top issues. So an info card tells your resident what goes in. We like to use pictures, you know, folks can't, they're not gonna read a long list of things. We need to have pictures to tell them quickly what they can do, what they can't. Tags to let them know when they um, make a mistake. And a top issue mailer to really drive home a top message that you and your local processor um, really want your residents to hear. Um, at drop-off sites, uh, we can do this for drop-off as well. It's a little bit different. Um, really, you'll see that on-site staff can be so important at drop-off sites. So instead of putting a tag on, uh, on a curbside cart or bin, you're really getting that, you're still getting that personalized feedback. Um, and then always clear signage and um, specific communications. And so here are just some other quick examples of some of the materials we put together. You'll see a lot of similar things. The info cards still are very picture heavy. Our top issues are still a single top issue that that's really what we're driving home. And then of course you wanna make it relevant to drop off as opposed to curbside. And so now that's just a quick kind of overview. And now I'm gonna jump into like what it really is to run a Feed on the Street campaign. Uh, so first step one, you got to set it up. You got to have clear roles and responsibilities with all your stakeholders, whether that is your local uh, processor, you know, keep Oklahoma beautiful affiliate, um, of course, in our case, a grantee and the partnership. And really, you know, you just want to have a, a firm foundation to start on because it's it's a lot of work to do these projects. Second, um, you want to sort it out. So you want to know where and how your program is performing. Um, for example, you know, you need to go to your local processor or your MRF, your material recovery facility, and you want to know what your current contamination is. You want to know what your top issue is. You, know, you don't need to run an education campaign before you know really exactly what you need to educate your residents on. Um, and so if that's not being sorted and measured already, I would really, um, strongly advise you to, to work with your, with your local processor. Um, if you're not talking to your processor once every six months, I would suggest you kind of start to up that, that timeline. And so here, um, this is just a quick example of what you might could get out of that composition. You wanna know what's in your mix, what your residents are putting in there, and then what your top contaminants are. And then you want to implement the program. So I'm going to go through a lot of slides on just like what that implementation looks like. So um, you want to let the community know what's happening. Obviously, sometimes folks may not like you lifting up a, a curbside cart. Then you'd conduct the, the campaign itself, as I'm, which I'm going to walk you through. Um, there's there's a whole education campaign to con to to consider. And then always you want to measure and collect data. Here at the Recycling Partnership, we're a very data-centric um, um, organization. 
And we really try to move our, our communities and our partners to also be data centric and to really know your program, not just sort of anecdotally, but to be able to track it over time. We'll talk about that too some more. And so um, the basics for deploying feed on the street, um, review our anti-contamination kit, which we'll talk uh, more about later this morning. Uh, you want to determine your rejection policy. You want to get a budget and a plan for staffing. This is all that kind of internal work. Design your tags, build a team, um, figure out how you're going to track and what you're going to track, and then um, and then you get to it. And so a way to think of feet on the street is the actual deployment of one of our anti-contamination kits. The anti-contamination kit takes you step by step with all the resources, all the design, everything you need. And then feet on the street is you putting that into action. Uh, so this is just a quick example. Um, we'll talk more about this later, so I'm not gonna dig into it, but this is what the first page of the anti-contamination kit looks like. And anytime you see a pink word, as you start to download it and look at it, that's a link. That's a link to take you to a resource, to a file, to something like that. Um, and so one of the first things you wanna do is get a common understanding between you your stakeholders and your processor about what is acceptable and unacceptable. We have a MRF survey you can download off our website. Your, your MRF or processor, processor will fill it out. And that way you can design all of your outreach so that it's specific to what is acceptable and what can be marketed. Um, and that should be a part of your contract as well. And then here's that same thing I just showed you, but I, I wanted to show it to you again, because again, this is an education campaign. First and foremost, this is all about telling your residents what can go in the bin or the cart and what cannot. Um, so design the tags, you know, your message you want to be clear, concise, and simple. Um, and then there's a couple different tags you can do that I want to talk to you about, whether it's a warning, a rejection, or a thank you. Um, a quick word about warning tags. Um, it causes a little bit more work. You've got more tracking to do, but some communities don't want to jump straight to rejection. They want to give their, um, their residents maybe an opportunity to learn a little bit. We often uh, promote going straight to rejection because, again, you want to impact the behavior of your residents. So if you reject on the first try, you give a tag on there, you turn your cart, and that tells your resident, we have, uh, your resident has to take an action to fix their behavior. So when they see it's turned, they look, they see that you've marked no plastic bags, they quickly take the plastic bags out. They're gonna remember no plastic bags as you made, you, you added a behavior for them. Um, and so again, warning or rejection, if you are gonna do warning, that's fine, it can work, but you just, you need to be able to be tracking where you're warning residents because after that, second or third warning, you need to start rejecting because you're not informing that behavior well enough. Um, and then thank you tags. These can be great as well. Some communities like them, but again, it's more work, it's more printing, it's more tracking. And a thank you tag doesn't necessarily create a new behavior. It just says thank you. Um, but thank you is nice. So there's nothing wrong with saying thank you. Um, and so then you want to build your tag You've got your, you know, you've got your routes, you know where you're going, you've got your tags, you've got your education, and you just want to know, um, you want to be thinking carefully about what your tagging team is going to do. So uh, how many routes or how many households can they pass in an hour? Um, you know, it's what are they going to track and how you want to make sure you're training them on what you consider to be acceptable and unacceptable contamination. Is one plastic bag enough to mark a warning? Or is it two or three or five plastic bags? And then obviously train the team. We, you know, we want you to, at least our best management practices, say to hit every household four times, whether if it's weekly, that's every week. If it's every other week, you know, it takes eight weeks, but you want to hit them four times. Um, and, and so if you're going to train them, I would anticipate going out a fifth week, one prior to your data collection, just to get the kinks out. Um, and then always, we, we always stress this, particularly in, you know, this past year, 18 months of, of COVID, uh, you've got to be prepared for safety. PPE, supplies, 
you've got to have that ready. Um, and then there's just some other safety considerations as y'all are probably aware, but no headphones, um, have an emergency protocol in, in place, like be wary of high traffic roadways or unpaved streets. Um, and so safety first is always important. And then you've got to measure. Um, you've got to know how your program is doing and then how it does after this to make the case. So um, I'm going to jump into this a little bit, but just to see that you want your pre-tagging of a sort analysis that's done with your processor. During the tagging, you want to be looking at tagging rate, set out rate, participation rate, and your different contaminants. I'm going to go through those here in just a moment. And then afterwards, you want to do another sort at your MRF. You want to be able to say, we spent X amount of dollars, we saw this change in recycling behavior, and we saw this change in, re in contamination. You want to be able to tell that whole story um, top to bottom. So um, things to be considering is your set out rate. Um, that's the number of homes uh, with recycling placed curbside at any given time. Uh, that helps you with your kind of route maintenance. How many households participate on this route? You know, it helps you know how many households you can pack in. Your participation rate is the number of homes that put recycling out to be collected at least once a month. That gives you, a, that gives you an idea of, of how your community is engaging with your program. Uh, tagging and rejection rate lets you know uh, how they're responding to this education. And then your contaminants, um, that gives you the tools needed for the future to do continued education. If you're getting a lot of plastic bags and tanglers, now, you know, after you do this project, we wanna be thinking about how can we pull those tanglers out? Is it education? Do we need to give some drop-off resources? Things like that. So we're not just collecting data just to have it. We want to always be putting that into use. And then a tracking method. There's two ways. Um, you can do just data tracking with software. You know, that can either be Excel or something else or a manual tracking. We have some forms online that you could download. But um, if you were a grantee with us, for instance, we actually have our own tag app that has analytics, it's got a dashboard, we can train you on it. Uh, we are working with how to figure out how to expand it beyond our grantees. But just to know that if you're interested in doing this work, please reach out to me, um, both for just regular technical assistance, but if we could get you access to our app, which is currently on a case-by-case -case basis, so I can't promise anything, but it really uh, we're very proud of it, and it gives you a lot of dashboards and a lot of analytics on the back end, so you're not having to run um, graphs and charts yourself. And then you want to sort it out again. Again, we're, we're looking at that measurement. And so um, what we, you know, after you trained your team, you're going out on routes, you're tagging households, you're doing this for four times. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of hours. It's a lot of patience, and you want to know how to and then you want to tell the story again, top to bottom. You want to make the case to your elected leadership. You want to make the case to your staff that they did a good job and here's why. And you want to make it the case to your residents. And so um, I want to walk y'all through a few kind of results just to let you know, hopefully, what you can expect with this work. Um, and then, so in Atlanta, this is 2017. I'm presenting old data from Atlanta on purpose, and I'll tell you why here in just a second. Uh, their contamination rate dropped 57%. Uh, their capture rate, so that's actually getting more recyclables, went up 27% as you're working with your residents, as you're teaching them about recycling. Remember that number I told, that big number I told you um, at the very top, 84% of your residents likely think that recycling is a valuable service. So as you're starting to educate them more, they want to keep recycling. That takes your capture rate up. And the reason I'm presenting this old data in Atlanta is that they are still doing feet on the street work four years later. They have invested millions of dollars into this program because they're continuing to reap the returns. Because again, it's education. It's not a one and done. It is, this is a way to educate your residents on an ongoing basis. If your program changes, change up your design, you know, add or take something off your info card and run it again. Um, here are a couple places out in um, 
Ohio, Fairfield, Akron, and Centerville all had around a 44% reduction in contamination after this program. And you might be thinking like, what does that look like? 44% is a big number. And so um, this is sort of what it looks like. You, you take your contamination rate, um, the lower your contamination, the higher your blended value. And I will say that these numbers are based on old, um, the old index pricing from recyclingmarkets.net. Current blended values are actually much higher. But the, as an example, as that contamination rate goes down, your blended value goes up and you subtract the cost of your tagging program and that's your net increase. Um, of course, this does not reflect cost of processing and collection and it doesn't reflect labor um, or maintenance savings due to that contamination. So this is just, you know, this is the type of work you'd wanna do on just the value of the recyclables that you're moving into the stream. Um, and so from the state of Massachusetts, we did two, um, Dartmouth and New Bedford are two communities very close to each other. Um, Dartmouth did, wanted just to go straight to rejection, educating that resident and changing a behavior. Saw a 45% tagging decrease. New Bedford did great work, you know, wanted to educate their residents, didn't reject, and still saw a 22% tagging decrease. That's great, 22%. That's nothing to sniff at. It's not quite 45, though. Um, and then, you know, here's another some case study out of Grand Rapids where uh, you'll see that their tagging rate goes down. So you're tagging fewer and fewer households. But at the same time, if you'll notice, their set out rate goes way up. So more residents are setting out. And even though more residents are setting out, you're tagging fewer and fewer out. So that's where you're getting those extra recyclables and you're getting more recyclables and they're still cleaner than they were before. And I did wanna show you a couple of drop-off results. I'm sure out there in Oklahoma, y'all got several drop-off programs. Um, it works the same way. You still wanna run it, uh, you know, as you, the timing is different. It's not quite maybe once a week as you would with uh, running your curbside route, but you could have, staff out there every Monday for a month or every Monday, Wednesday, Thursday for a month, whatever works for your schedule. Um, but that personalized feedback still works. Um, here are several communities before and after. Um, this is with drop off. Um, Needham saw a 50% relative decrease of like a 42% that was 40 odd percent in Rossock. And then Alpena um, saw what looks to be, you know, that looks like a really close number. They already had a very low contamination rate of 10.93, and they still brought it down 10%. 10% relative is not bad, particularly for a community with only 11% contamination. And then um, just a few other contamination strategies specific to drop off, um, signage, security cameras, fencing, those are all really great infrastructure. But that on-site staff is just so powerful. Um, we like to do direct resident feedback. That's a person talking directly with your residents, saying hello, let them know what they got right, let them know what they got wrong. And also, it's a great way to do um, a really cheap way to survey your residents, how they feel about recycling, what are, um, would they be willing to pay more for it, what are their hurdles, is their convenience center drop-off close to them, so um, if you do have someone on site managing contamination, go ahead and give them a survey form and, and just see how your residents are feeling about your program. All that can get bundled into your next round of education. Um, I have a lot of resources I'll quickly go through, but I wanna leave um, time for questions. So we have a state of curbside report. Uh, we actually have a lot of reports that we would love for y'all to read. They're freely available to you. Um, we have cart grant opportunities. Um, we can help fund a cart up to $15 per household for a universal system. Um, you can learn more about that. Those are the type of projects I mostly work on. I'd love to hear from you if you're thinking about curbside. Um, we have a ton of online tools. We'll talk a little bit more about those this weekend. I mean, later this morning, sorry. But um, I wanted them to be here for you so if you access this deck later. Social media kits. 
uh, a closed Facebook group that is just for um, city and county recycling coordinators. So you can talk to your peers about what you need, what works, what doesn't. And then we, uh, we really pushed this municipal measurement program to help you kind of organize your metrics and compare apples to apples when you're looking at other programs. So I know I ran through a lot. I know it was fast, but um, I wanted to talk. I wanted to give you all as much information as I could, and I would love to take questions or comments now if there are any. Vincent, that's some amazing stuff. I appreciate that. And for anyone, uh, Ellen reminded us in the chat that um, Oklahoma is Vincent, uh, his territory with the Recycling Partnership Group. So if, uh, if you want to um, uh, get in contact with him, of course, his information is on our program. And uh, as with all of our presenters, and we'll have uh, uh, we'll have Vincent Larray in one of our breakout sessions later this morning to be able to talk. But any more questions? You can raise a hand, or you can ask a question. Let's see. Checking through there. Galia from uh, Broken Arrow, uh, Broken Arrow said that they have been uh, doing some resources like this, and we'll definitely be reaching out to talk to you, Vincent. So. Great. We've worked with Broken Arrow before. Love that. Uh, intrigues me because did I understand you say that, for instance, in McAllister, uh, we only have drop off. We don't have curbside, but we're constantly working with the city of McAllister to implement that. So we could have surveys, mail outs for all the citizens to answer questions, what they think about or uh, they interested in curbside and mail it back to the uh, to the city. Correct. Yeah, um, that's a great way to to sort of prove to your elected officials and to the powers that be that this is a wanted service from your residents is to ask your residents. I mean, that is a, a great first step, really. It's something we really push for. Interesting. Anybody else? We still have a couple minutes. If you have some questions, I, I'm definitely going to be looking at recyclingpartnership.org without a doubt. All right, Vincent, thank you so much. I'm, I'm full of information now. Thank Again, you. information, thank you, is in the uh, program. Um, all right, we're going to run ourselves just a little ahead of schedule, so the next time we get a break, we might get a second longer then. See what we have here. Let's see. All right, next up, we're going to hear from uh, Preston McIntyre. Whoops. Hi there. Hey, Preston. Presence with Roto Chopper and our spotlight sponsor for today. Okay, um, let me uh, let me get set up here to share my screen with you. All right, everybody, see our, our logo there. Yep, it looks good. It, it looks right. good, Preston. Super, fact, fantastic. Okay, well, I'm with Roto Chopper, um, and I just wanted to take a couple minutes to uh, to share who we are, what we do. Um, some of you may be familiar with us as a company, may be familiar, familiar with, with the type of equipment that we manufacture. Um, so I appreciate the few minutes here to discuss Rotochopper. So essentially, uh, in, a, in a single sentence, we design, build, and support a complete line of horizontal grinders, wood chip processors, asphalt shingle grinders, and mobile bagging systems from the state of art manufacturing facility in Minnesota. In a nutshell, if you have a composting program or a C&D recycling operation, uh, our type of equipment is, is most likely the type of equipment that you would have uh, involved uh, in that operation. Uh, Roto Chopper, we're an ESOP company, which means we're employee owned and we're committed to the roots uh, of our small Midwestern US company. We operate as a factory direct sales and service. It's always been our business model. Uh, we feel like this positions us to be uniquely invested in the success and satisfaction, satisfaction of, of each customer. Our philosophy uh, we, is founded on the belief that grinding equipment should do more than just reduce the volume of waste heading to the landfill. And we believe that waste materials are an opportunity for economic growth and environmental, environmental sustainability. And we remain committed to supplying the solutions uh, that maximize the value of raw materials uh, by transforming them into premium products as profitably as possible. And our mission is to create economically and environmentally sustainable solutions for fiber sizing applications by supplying practical grinding equipment. And to help achieve this goal, we are uniquely focused on customer satisfaction. Uh, on the screen here, these are just um, some dates, some general dates of, of key 
I guess, moments in history for us. We have several others, uh, but essentially we started out in 1982 as Pelts Manufacturing. Through the years, we transitioned to Roto Chopper Incorporated. Uh, we've got some on this on this sheet here, some key dates of particular machines that we've designed and built, uh, as well as some new things coming out for us. Here is just a general overview of our diesel uh, horizontal grinders. And again, if you're familiar with grinders, we uh, manufacture just horizontal grinders. There, there are tub grinders out there, but our business is horizontal grinders. In terms of size, uh, our smallest unit uh, in terms of horsepower is gonna be 275 horsepower and we go all the way up to 1,050 horsepower. Uh, our diesel units are available either on tires or tracks. And um, our track units um, are also available as what we call a track and dolly, meaning that it does not require a low boy trailer to go from point A to point B. The, the dolly allows us to transport that track machine without the, the utilization of a big heavy trailer. This is a, a general overview of our stationary electric grinders. Now stationary electric grinders uh, are gonna be in an application where maybe there's wood waste uh, being generated or accumulated uh, on a daily basis. It's maybe more of a consistent inbound of material. Uh, being portable with the grinder is not necessary uh, for this type of, um, of operation. Uh, the, in terms of horsepower, we build it as small as 150 horsepower, which would be typically in a, saw, uh, a sawmill application or a small pallet operation. Uh, and we go up to 1,000 horsepower on our stationary electric machines. Now, a stationary electric machine uh, probably the, the, the key advantage of an electric machine over a diesel grinder is there's significantly less maintenance. You know, when you think of a, a diesel grinder, um, you've got a diesel engine that you're maintaining, which means you have engine oil, you have air filters, you have a clutch, you have a radiator, uh, an alternator. Those are all things that maybe over time would require some maintenance. On a stationary electric machine, all of that goes away. And... Um, uh, it's, it's a cheaper machine to operate, uh, but the trade-off is you are giving up portability. Um, we probably, in terms of our business, I would say 35 to 40% of the machines that we manufacture uh, are electric or stationary electric machines. We also build some, uh, some other uh, unique machines. Uh, the GoBagger 250 is a machine that um, allows a facility to, to essentially be in the bagging business. Typically, if you have product compost mulch that you want to put in a bag, uh, you might have to put in a fully automated form fill seal operation, and you could spend up to a million dollars for something like that. Whereas our portable portable bagging machine allows a facility to to bag rock, sand, compost mulch, uh, just about anything you want to put in the bag. Uh, CP118 is a machine that is typically used in the arborist. Uh, environment where a uh, company has tree chips coming off of their, their chippers, but yet they're still stringy, branchy, uh, not really uh, a saleable product as is. And the CP118 will regrind those chips to a consistent size and also gives the ability to color it if you want to make colored mulch uh, or just to make a, a natural mulch. And then we have uh, stacking conveyors that we're just now coming out with, uh, 65 foot to 100 foot stacking conveyors. You would use a stacking conveyor uh, to minimize material handling, uh, just to make larger piles. And then we've got uh, the DK75 and the DK95 low-speed shredders. A, a low-speed shredder is, is essentially different than a high-speed grinder, uh, like the machines I've showed you a couple slides, the last couple of slides, in the sense that high-speed grinders, you don't want to have much metal contamination go into the high-speed grinder because it's a, it's a high-speed rotor uh, that can cause damage. Whereas a low speed high torque shredder, it's designed to be able to handle uh, heavy metal contamination. Now it's not going to size your wood waste uh, similar to what a high speed grinder can because a high speed grinder utilizes a screen to uh, determine the particle size. But the low speed shredder will allow you to process material. The magnets on the machine will pull the, the metal out and then you are left with a coarse uh, but clean wood waste pile, which if you needed to further re reduce that in size, you could then put that material into a high speed grinder uh, to make your finished product. Um, sometimes it might take both of those machines, uh, depending on what your um, market opportunity is for the raw material. Uh, but a low speed high torque shredder is typically used uh, like in a C&D recycling operation or uh, maybe a MSW operation where you're just wanting to reduce uh, material going to the landfill, reduce it in size. 
Some key features on rototropper grinders, we, we've got more, but these are just some key features. Our grinders, uh, our larger grinders have a replaceable mount rotor. Uh, again, if you're familiar with, with uh, horizontal grinders, uh, maybe it's uh, the machines that you have would have a weld on mount or maybe a pin style rotor. Uh, our, our rotor allows for uh, an operator to independently change out tooth mounts. And the reason why that's important is you know, over time, you could damage a tooth mount by hitting an ungrindable or just wearing your teeth down too far. Uh, this allows an operator to change a tooth mount out in short time um, to put a new one on. Uh, whereas with your, if you're pulling rods or you're getting out a cutting torch in a welder, it's a much bigger project uh, to do that. Uh, Rotolink is a system that we developed over the last few years. And essentially that's, that's re a real time remote monitoring system that allows um, our service department to be able to log in at any time, see your machine, uh, make adjustments uh, in the control panel just as if they were, they're standing right there on the ground. Uh, another unique feature of Rotolink is every week it generates a report. Um, it'll, it'll, it tracks you know, how many hours was the engine on, how many hours were you grinding, um, how many hours until you need to change the oil or grease the bearings. This is all information that is there. And what Rotolink does for us is uh, we've designed it to basically um, uh, gather that information, put it in a report form and send it, send it out weekly. So a service department or um, um, maybe a manager is constantly being fed this information. So um, there's no surprises. Um, there's no uh, wondering, hey, how come we haven't ground for the last few days? You know, it's it's all there uh, at your at your fingertips. Screen changing is is a is a great feature on roto chopper grinders because uh, it's a bit, it's a simple process, uh, especially compared to some of our competitors. We're able to change screens in our machine, and, and changing screens is important if you're producing various finished products where you need to produce uh, different size uh, materials. Uh, we can change screens in a roto chopper in 15, 20 minutes. Doesn't require any support equipment. Um, it's done at the ground level. Uh, we have high use of hydraulics on the machine with the engine off. Uh, so it's a, it's a simple uh, process to change screens in a roto chopper. The stopwatch monitoring system, that is a system that um, allows us to monitor vibration on the rotor. And that does a couple of things uh, for our customers. One, it, it helps minimize damage from impacts of an ungrindable. Again, we don't want to have big metal go into a high speed grinder, but it's not if if it happens, it's just when. It's going to happen at some point. And the way that stopwatch system works is when it detects a spike in the vibration, uh, essentially our end feed conveyor that's bringing material into the grinding chamber will stop back or go in reverse and it stops. And um, you know that allows that, that ungrindable to exit the, uh, the grinding chamber and, and minimize damage. Um, it also, since it's giving a real-time readout, we're constantly uh, knowing what the vibration of the rotor is at any one time. And so over time, teeth on the, on the rotor can wear a little different from one side to the other, and it can be a gradual increase of vibration to the point that it, an operator doesn't even realize that the machine is, is way out of balance. And, and an out of balance rotor on a high speed grinder uh, can start to cause problems down the road, meaning you've got hydraulic hoses that are rubbing together, you have electrical wires rubbing together, um, those things can start causing other problems. Um, bearings can, can go out on, on you prematurely if you have an out of balance rotor. So the stopwatch system allows, uh, allows us to make sure that the rotor never gets um, out of spec in terms of uh, vibration and, and causing those problems. Roto load scan is a new one for us that we developed over the last year or two. And essentially we're using LIDAR technology uh, it's uh, basically a camera that is mounted above the discharge conveyor belt, and it's able to scan material as it goes up the discharge conveyor belt. We um, are um, using that information, the information of the speed of the belt, the width of the belt, and um, essentially be able to provide a real-time readout of the production rate going up uh, the discharge belt. So at any one, uh, any one day, you don't have to look out there at the pile and say, hmm, that pile looks to be you know, 800 yards of material, you, you actually know how much uh, material you ground or produce that day uh, with the Roto load scan system. Um, our factory direct uh, support team is identical to our sales team. Um, and now we also have service tech spread out through the country. 
Um, but our, our support staff and, and uh, service guys, and you, you can't get more top notch than, than a group based out of the factory where the equipment is uh, designed, engineered, built. Um, it's, it's top notch service. Um, we offer a prevent and maintenance program, which um, we've got customers who maybe will schedule it six months um, at a time or maybe one year at a time. And the prevent and maintenance program allows a, a business owner or say in the case of a city where um, you know, a manager is not really around the grinder much, um, they would receive a report. Our service tech comes to spend generally about a half a day going through the machine, has a checklist um, and provides a report after the visit to say, hey, you know, here's what we see. You know, here's, here are some things maybe you should be considering uh, in the future of doing some maintenance or, hey, this is, this is a problem you need to get it solved uh, solved now. So the pre and maintenance program allows uh, us to just continue to lay eyes on the machine and because uh, we're never trying to shove service visits down anybody's throat, but it is nice to get an expert eyes on the machine and just make sure that that machine uh, is staying in good health. Um, so that's that's our service department. Um, that's uh, that's my spiel. That's essentially we manufacture equipment to take big wood and make it into a lot of small pieces. And um, and um, we've got several models. And you know if you're a city or uh, a county that is uh, has a compost operation or uh, looking to put one in, we would just love an opportunity to be able to share uh, share information on Roto Chopper Grinders with you. Thank you, Preston. That is a lot of really good information. And again, if you need to contact him, obviously it's there on the screen. And it is also in our program. So just uh, open up the, toward the end of your program, see uh, how to contact him. Indeed, we're going to take a five minute break a five minute break, come back in um, five minutes right here. And, uh, and, and I promise you wanna be involved. We've got another drawing coming. So five minute break. Man, for, for the fact that we've only done an hour, we've had a lot of really good information so far, haven't we? It, it has really been amazing. The resources that are out there are good. That way we don't have to start from scratch. And I'm glad that people at this conference are finding out what some of those resources resources are so they can take advantage of them. That's really cool. It really is. All right. So technically, I believe we are back. Uh, that's been our five minutes. So come on in because we're going to have a drawing. We have a drawing for a pair of the wonderful socks that, that are so cool and are, are uh, well appreciated. So let me find out where my okay, here are the socks. Here are the socks. Oh. Go ahead. There's, there they are. All right, Bobby Schultz, are you in today? Bobby Schultz, and, are you with us and today? I'm glad to win because my wife stole the pair that I already had. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, love it. So this is your second pair. I'm sure your wife can steal some more. How about that? <laughs> That's about that right. is wonderful. Ellen, well, I'm thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Ellen Bussert is going to explain about our breakout sessions that we're about to attend. And uh, will you also introduce the uh, discussion topics and facilitators? Is that me, Ellen? Uh, that's me. That's me. That's certainly. Certainly. Okay. For those of you, if this is your first year to the conference, when we meet in person, we had round table discussions. And basically, you would have about 30 minutes to go to a table topic. There would be a facilitator and uh, the facilitator might lead with the intro and then you would get to ask your your deep questions about um, preparing recyclables or what do you do about city council people or other things well when we went to virtual we moved it to breakout rooms uh, all of you when you signed up had to put out what your preference was you had a choice of two different breakout rooms you don't have to worry, this will happen automatically. When I get done speaking, you will be sent to your first breakout room. You'll have approximately 30 minutes. Um, so uh, meet with your facilitator, ask your questions. Um, this is a good time to have some 101 with experts in different areas. Our breakout rooms today, Recycling 101, currently accepted materials is Tracy Horst with the Choctaw Nation. Uh, she has been recycling probably since she could talk and she is a wealth of knowledge. Um, challenges of commercial recycling, we have Dr. Lisa Skumatz, who will be uh, uh, in that session. 
uh, session number three is the Recycling Partnerships Anti-Contamination Kits. They have them for drop-off programs and for curbside. And Vincent will be able to talk a little more about those educational resources. And then finally, we have Josh Boyer and with Ripple Glass, and he will be talking about glass and glass recycling. So um, at the end of the session, you'll get a two minute warning. And even if you're in mid sentence at two minutes, you will be switched to your ne next breakout session. Um, and then at, after the second breakout session, uh, we'll all get back together. So uh, I will have our technical director uh, move us right now to our breakout sessions. Everybody hang on. Looks like we've got about a minute before we're all due back. So if you all will start making your way back, if you're waiting for someone to make some noise at you, one minute and we're back on. All right, I see 1120. So we are back and ready to go. I believe all of our next uh, folks, yes, are here with us. Okay, we need to do a, a drawing. We do need to do a drawing for a pair of okra socks. Let me see here. I know I've got this. Here's the drawing. All right, so, okay. Kima Borshra. Kima, are you with us today? I don't know if Kima gets to be here with us. Uh, if so, uh, if not, you have to be here. You have to be, oh, Kima is present to win. How about that? You got a pair of socks, Kima. I see her in the, the, uh, the chat box. So Ellen will take care of you and uh, make sure you have a pair of the okra socks. I know you're gonna love those too. I know it. All right, we get back to my information of our uh, last, we don't forget, stay with us now because we still have uh, some more drawings. As a matter of fact, after this next session, the uh, drawing for $100 gift card. So don't, uh, don't run away. All right, let's see where we are here. Introducing now um, Dr. Lisa Skumatz, President and Principal, and Anne Vanderfleet, Research Analysis uh, Analyst Consultant from uh, Skumatz Economic Research Associates. Dr. Skumatz, take it away. Thank you so much. Let me get my screen shared here. There it is. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for uh, inviting us here. We're really pleased to speak to Okra, and um, we'll be talking about practical strategies for addressing contamination. And note that this is some work that from a draft study we just uh, finished, or a, a study we just finished for EREF, and um, we're really pleased to have gotten the chance to do this work. I'll talk about the purpose, the seven groups of strategies, and the high performers. Drill down on outreach and oops, uh, some uh, oops tags and education, and also uh, the processing re uh, recommendations that we learned about. I'll talk also about some outreach, um, our overarching and longer run strategies, and then summarize the results. And again, EREF was the funder for this. So the study's focus, the, the approach for the study was some core questions. What can be done to get to cleaner materials? What makes sense to recycle, that meaning collecting and processing, and is there a sustainable recycling structure? The methods we used to do that included literature review, case studies, interviews, uh, subject matter expert interviews, SMEs, and stakeholders, and a nationwide community survey, data analysis, modeling for both collection and for detailed processing, MRF modeling as well. Our study grouped the final results into 40 strategies in 40 strategies in seven groups that recognize near, medium, and longer term. Program design and materials. What's going to be delivered? Education, collection, contracting, processing, government and industry, and national or state policies. We have a poll question wondering about which of the strategies is most interesting to you. Take it away. So education, collection, national and state policy, government industry, okay. Less on processing and contracting, okay. <clears throat> Very interesting, thanks. The study has three main parts of the, uh, of the results and the um, 
um, and what I wanted to point out here in particular is that there are real details on, you know, after the sort of what are the results, there's real detail on each of the strategies, including case studies for places where it happened and statistics and sources, and a whole section that is case studies, um, a, a lot of pages of case studies with a map against what community has which strategy and by strategy, if you're looking for the strategy across the community. So a lot of information in the study and appendices with modeling results and so on. Uh, it includes some uh, which which programs are sort of least effective and most hard to implement up to those that are most effective and easiest to implement. And we also score them based on some key criteria. Contamination reduction, of course, this is about contamination. Cost containment or sort of how cost effective it is relatively. Retaining tons to recognize that people have goals they're trying to meet too or not. Uh, we want to make sure that we still have a lot of recycling going on and the ease of implementation and weighted scoring and so on. And they're, they're also written about in the, in the study, but I'm going to talk about them individually instead. First, program design and allowable materials. Here's an inventory of the strategies we looked at and looked for case studies and so on um, around the country. You can eliminate selected materials, those difficult materials, you can eliminate them. You can put in bag fees or bag bans, given that bag, bags are a major contaminant. You can do customer cart contamination penalties. Um, don't, don't contaminate in the cart or, or we'll do something. Special treatment glass uh, being one of the difficult com commodities, community organized programs, or you could drop the recycling program. I wanted to mention uh, one about special glass treatment. You know, one of the things that um, uh, people can do is, you know, glass is an issue. You've got markets issues that have not been solved. There is not that magic use for, for mixed color glass that just doesn't exist. There's a silver bullet yet. It complicates more processing and there are distance issues. It's heavy, low value. That's never a pretty story versus the fact that it's a lot of tons. If you're trying to reach tonnage based recycling goals, it's gonna hurt you if glass is encountered in there. And it's, you know, inherently it's very recyclable. Um, some people have tried separate containers curbside or they um, have, they go, they go to a drop off model where they say instead, here we have these bunkers for the different colors, please put your glass there. One community didn't want to lose the tonnage they knew, or lose the sort of goodwill of that, that commingled container they have, but also wanted people to make smarter choices. So they did education that explained that, gee, do you know that most of the glass that comes into this um, uh, uh, commingled bin doesn't get recycled, but if you bring it to the drop-off, the vast majority of that gets recycled, that's a much better option. Um, and it turns out, even if you don't allow uh, glass in your container at the curb, two to 5% ends up in there anyway. So it's kind of a, a, you need to recognize that that's not going to be zero, regardless of what you do. Um, so that what they did was they, they gave that education and the tonnage did not go down dramatically and it moved to a place where they could use it a lot better. They worked with people, they gave them information to make smarter decisions. So that was Fort Collins, uh, Colorado did that and it was really quite successful. Bottle bills help glass, you know, go through a different system that makes it not uh, not not uh, conflict with the processing issues. Yes, it's kind of con it, it can be a contaminant that's also abrasive, but it turns out it's not that doesn't add that much to maintenance costs at at facilities. There's some people that are trying to deal with glass by market development. There are a few that have you know there, and and so glass is you know there are a number of different things, but there are you know if you get glass out early on. It may, in the processing, it may be something that can be dealt with. Um, some people are looking at the fact that other um, materials are also problematic. And so they've established, and, and they might need special treatment, not just glass. So in some cases, they've got a separate program where you bag three through sevens, a separate um, for hard to, hard to recycle items. They sometimes have a fee and collection system for that. Um, and we see bagged textiles programs also where the bagged textiles are collected at the curve free periodically. Number of case studies in the study. Um, as far as what materials are being selectively eliminated, they're listed in the second bullet there on the left, glass, yogurt cups, clamshells, microwave trays, three through seven, aseptic, gable top, mixed paper, cardboard, but less so now. These are, these are the kinds of materials that people have been um, eliminating from some programs. Um, uh, 
let's see, community organized programs might be something that's a little bit tricky. I'm gonna leave the cart contamination penalties because that's something that Anne's gonna talk a little bit about um, in a related way. Um, community organized programs are when the program was dropped due to contamin contamination or low prices or something, they open up a um, they open up collection centers that sort separate materials, and that you know at the local level they um, make a little drop program, drop box, uh, um, drop off program or something like that to try to make recycling still happen. Um, some communities have gotten together and kind of reopened local merks, but with more limited materials, that sort of thing. There are a number of studies about that as well. Education strategies, Anne's going to talk about the highlights from that. Collection options include going to dual stream, keeping doing source separation at the curb, improving collection cost effectiveness. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because if you your program for collection is more, more cost, then the program if if you keep the program cost the same, the rates the same, you may be able to take some of that cost effectiveness, you know, the savings from collection and use it to pay the higher tipping fees for getting materials cleaner, slowing them down and doing other processing things that, that may, uh, may improve the system or using some of that funding for better education to get things cleaner as well. Uh, the kind of uh, strategies Anne's gonna talk about in a minute. There are also upgraded containers that sort of alert you with cameras or AI um, to uh, contamination as things are being dropped into a cart. Uh, there are also um, upgraded drop-offs. I do want to talk about the dual stream uh, issue. Um, certainly there's a question about um, communities that have dual stream, should they stay dual stream? Communities that don't have dual stream, should they go dual stream? Well, contamination is, uh, there's a, a strong, uh, Strong perception that that dual stream is less contaminated than than single stream, um, but if you don't have dual stream now, if you've moved to single stream, it is expensive to revert to dual stream. You've got to uh, get carts because very often it's not always in carts uh, in a dual stream program. Maybe trucks. You've got a second collection now. You've got to do new education. You have to maybe do some enforcement or things like that. So it's not zero to revert to a dual stream. And regardless of whether you're talking dual stream or single stream plastic bags is still an issue it just shows up all the time there's also customer pushback we find that when communities have gone to single stream getting going back to dual stream is customers don't want to do that it's very uh they're very happy with single stream programs we know we know of some programs where a dual stream MRF was built and yet all the local haulers go 40 drive right by it and go 40 extra miles to the place where they take single stream material because the customers want single stream. So it's it's a little bit complicated. Um, Dr. Uh, Lee, ask a question. I, we had a couple in chat and I don't want them to get away. Um, uh, so I'm gonna throw these to you unless you would like all your questions at the end. Michael asked, or he actually said, I love to talk about modeling processing. Can you go a little further into detail and some best strategies you recommend? Also another question, uh, how much population you define small communities, or how do you define that? Uh, that's a good question. I'm going I'm to leave modeling one to a little bit later, um, and walk and because it shows up as a set of strategies in a moment. Um, but how much population we define as as small? I think you're talking about that in relation to this dual stream, single stream question. You know, I don't have a break off for that right now. This is a draft report, and I am going to try to figure that out because I think it's a really great question. It has mostly to do with the small MRF. And if you've got a small MRF where you can't, you can't sort of spread the cost of uh, optical sorters or, um, or uh, um, oh my gosh, robots across enough tons, that, that, that doesn't make sense. It's really about that. Those two pieces of, those two steps are really important to getting a single stream pro, uh, program to get clean at the MRF. So it's really about the size of the MRF almost more than it is about the size of the community. So, okay. Thank you, that's exactly what they're about. Great. Um, the next one is uh, uh, up to drop-offs, just you know, making sure you have container slots that are limiting and getting just the materials that you want. Focus on signage, cameras, you know, containers, staffing, um, because that can really help with uh, keeping it clean and regular collection so it's never overflowing. That overflowing is always a contamination problem. And then they're going to bring their recycles in a bag or something. Make sure you have something for them to put those bags in at the end so they don't just end up throwing them into the recycling container. 
I'm not going to, there was almost no interest in, in contaminating or in contracting options in the, in the survey. So I may just go past this one to spend a little bit more time on some of the other ones. But the bottom line is there are, Mer there are contracts for between MRFs and communities that are changing right now. And there are real trends in dramatic changes in the structure of that relationships. Um, and also in penalties for contamination to try to, you know, get, get responsibilities going on both sides. MRF and end user contracts are really vital. Uh, they can really help a MRF have a great base load of business where they, they know they can produce a material that's exactly what a specific end user needs um, and to their specs. And that can be a great relationship. And then there are also, as part of these MRF community contracts, there are usually contamination surcharges and fees related to bringing in inbound material that's uh, highly contaminated. Those fees can be on the order of $50 a ton, $75 a ton, $118 a ton, and $225 a ton in some cases. And with processing costs going up um, from to $65, $90, and $95 a ton and more. I want to speak, turn it now over to Anne, who's going to talk a little about outreach and also processing. But we have a, sorry, we have a, a polling question next. And I, I have to go back to that. And that's going to require me to there. Okay. Do you want to lead this, please, Anne? Sure. So our polling question is Do you think oops tags can make a difference in your area? And I'll give a little bit. All right. I'm glad to see that no one said that they used them with bad results. So that's <laughs> awesome. Everyone's excited about oops tags. So um, breaking off a little bit from our study, I'm actually going to talk really quick about oops tags on a study that, um, that Lisa and I did last year in Colorado. So we had three treatment areas. The first received a recycling postcard and two rounds of oops tags. The second only received the postcard and the third area was our control area. We observed a decrease in contamination in these five materials. The ones highlighted in red are the ones that were improved by the oops tags. The greatest effect can be seen in overall reduction in contamination, or in other words, an increase in the percent of clean bins. The oops tag area saw a 32% net increase in the percent of clean bins. The postcard area also improved, but by a lower amount, and the control area actually got worse. The percent of bins contaminated with plastic bags decreased to less than 10% in the oops tag area. One thing to note with plastic bags is that there was a reduction in plastic bags in all three study areas, but the only statistically significant drop was in the oops tag area. Amazon, like those bubble mailers, uh, contamination was also greatly decreased in the oops tag area. Next slide. An interesting result from the oops tags is how important each oops tag is. The first oops tag gave us a significant change in contamination, while the second oops tag gave us little to no additional change. Now, this is not saying that the second oops tag was not important, but that the biggest bang for your buck is in that first oops tag. And here we can see the two results from the increase in clean bins. Almost all of it was in the first oops tag, and then the decrease in plastic bag contamination and all of our uh, contamination reduction was from that first oops tag. Next slide. Going back to our larger report, oops tags are being used around the country with really impressive results. So the blue column in the middle shows the percent reduction in contamination in programs that are using oops tags or cart tags. Marysville, Ohio, not only saw an 87% reduction in contamination from three rounds of oops tags, their contamination dropped from a huge 91% down to 12%. Medford, Oregon and Newton, Massachusetts have dropped their contamination to under 10% with oops tags and curbside cart rejection. Next, next slide, please. There are many free resources for setting up an oops tag program. Here are two great examples. The first is Recycling Partnerships Anti-Contamination Recycling Kit. And the second is North Carolina's DEQ Cart Tagging 101. Next slide. Other outreach strategies are simplifying the message to reduce, reduce confusion among residents. Republic's Recycling Simplified and Monroe County, New York's Refresh Recycling only focus on four materials. Republic's program pilot saw contamination drop from 38% to 30%, and Monroe County's current contamination rate is 10%. Next slide. 
A MRFsted is a regional grouping that is usually done in larger communities or with multiple haulers or MRFs. The MRF shed finds which materials are accepted by everyone in the group and focuses outreach on those items. The idea is to have consistent messaging across social media, mailers, and websites, etc., and have that consistent throughout the entire region. Next slide. Some communities focus on the don'ts instead of the do's, such as don't include food waste or liquids, or don't bag your recycling. And many communities are telling residents to ignore the numbers on the bottom of uh, on the bottom of the containers and to focus on um, and to focus on recycling by category. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about a few more strategies from the report, such as processing, government, and long-term strategies. These are the 14 best practices for process for processing improvements that a MRF can make to reduce bale contamination. These include tip floor, glass options, various equipment and materials, such as robots and optical sorters, last chance sort options, strategies for retaining sorters, using a positive sort, adjusting speed and volume, and looking at secondary and specialized processing options. Next slide. What we found from interviews with a number of subject matter experts, such as MRF operators, is that the tip floor was highly emphasized by all, suggesting that inspection upon arrival and immediate feedback to the haulers is vital in making sure that contaminants never even enter the MRF. When material is put on the tip floor, it's best to handle it gently to reduce mixing because that makes it harder to separate. Some operators prefer to actually just dump the material straight into the metering bin, and all of them requested that recycling trucks use less compaction. Slowing the speed and volume allows equipment and sorters to perform better, but of course that immediately reduces the capacity. And again, the metering bin is really important for achieving this low level of a thin layer of material that robots and optical sorters need in order to operate. And finally, several said to break glass early to make sure it never hits the fiber screens. Next slide. We modeled 19 different variations in equipment and materials, such as an auger on pre-sort, robots on plastic, an eddy current on the last chance or the residue line, and so on. These results, um, the results of those runs are in the report. We also varied the conditions that were associated with those scenarios, such as tip fees, market price, and inbound contamination level, among others. And we ran these 19 scenarios for each variation and for different MRP sizes. Next slide. All right, and Lisa, I think that's back to you. It is. Um, some of the options that can also uh, be undertaken are, are sort of done by government or uh, related to industry. Some are some voluntary standards or agreements that, that um, governments can do jointly or, or um, industry actors can can put together. We'll talk a little, show you an example of that. There are community, another thing is a kind of a catch-all, community metrics, authority and MRF contracts, sort of a, the government getting together to um, suggest changes in some of these things that, that will help move toward less contamination. There's local and state market development trying to uh, created a, a local use for materials. That means that, that uh, materials can go more, more directly and that there's better use of the materials in the end and higher prices and therefore more uh, need for them. Uh, requiring industry to address contamination. The requiring industry to address contamination has been kind of an interesting one that I, I, I'm gonna spend more time on ones that maybe aren't familiar to people. There are some states that are requiring communities to address contamination in contracts or plans. They're saying, if the state of Florida says you, in your contracts, you must address contamination and, and say that it's gotta be paid attention to or gotta be addressed. In Washington, they I have a state uh, contamination reduction plan. And it's also requiring that state, that contamination reduction plans get put in by locality, for localities. And they're putting together some templates for that and expectations for what must be in that document. In Oregon, there's a contain, contamination reduction education plan. It's one of sort of 13 menu strategies that, lo, that the localities have to um, that that localities have to implement, and they uh, have to a, assess contamination, choose a sector they're going to focus on, like residential or commercial or you know whatever, and then report the progress and results on that to the state. This is quite a different uh, approach than than most uh, strategies I've I've seen. 
There's some voluntary standards and agreements going on in place where manufacturers are pledging to use recycled content or where some groups are getting together to establish agreements on what are recycling standards, what are uh, that sort of thing. You know, there are certainly businesses that have said we're pledging to do to uh, do recyclable, recyclable or composting packaging. I think that's been happening for some decades and people may have a skeptical eye about that, but that is going on. Um, and also there are uh, commitments, commitments, uh, new plastics economy global with commitments and also some recycling standards I list at the bottom here. The community metrics one is about sort of, a, a, communities are looking at revising their metrics to try to say, it isn't all about tons anymore. It's about quality too. And so they're modifying their metrics to, to try to, in, to incorporate things beyond just tons. Um, and they're also trying to in, consider things like getting more collection authority, either through ordinances or contracting, so that they can require things like audits, um, addressing contamination, authority for drivers to reject carts, requiring education efforts, and you know, proving materials are not recycled, things like that to get better performance so that contamination is reduced. At a higher level, these are the strategies at that sort of last or high level are various kinds of EPR, uh, pro program funding and take back, take back models, ADFs or advanced disposal fees or eco -mod modulated fees, bottle bills, product content standards, policies to, to um, encourage simplifying packaging, trusted bail certification or verification, commodity markets and trading and carbon strategies. And I'm gonna talk about a few of these in particular. First, probably one of the most vital strategy I think that would actually solve the problem is related to trusted bail certification verification. If, if a bail that is dirty on the market looks the same as a bale that is clean on the market, and and they're going to and they're going to receive the same price. There is zero um, zero incentive for the facility cleaning, making that bale, that mirth, making a bale that's clean versus one that's dirty. If there's no way to identify a clean one or a dirty one, and there's no charge, there's no price preference for a clean one, then you are dumb. I'm sorry, dumb to invest the extra time, effort and equipment to get it to clean. So until there's bail certification and verification and the subsequent price differential that would occur, that there's, we're, at, we're on an uphill battle because whether the material comes in clean or the material comes in dirty, they may, I mean, the incentive is just not, not clean the stuff that's clean anymore and just, you know, it will end up dirty at the, at the end. There are no incentives until China came in, there were zero incentives. What's vital now, China is providing this service, bail certification and verification, whether we like it or not, and, and providing price differentials through rejection, if nothing else. Um, third party auditing with a trusted entity, with a chain of custody um, that, that tells what happened is really vital to solving the problem overall. Um, that you need clear definitions, and there are several actions going on to try to get to definitions, and then a certification entity is probably the single most important strategy to the real long-term system-wide solution. Another thing that happens if you get bail certification and quality differentials is to go ahead and look at commodity different commodity trading. We could get materials on the Chicago Board of Trade, CDOT. And if it's if it's a revive, if it's a commodity that can be traded, then there can be futures and options, and that helps moderate price volatility. And you could have predictable program costs because you could do options and futures to make that so. And you know, cities can deal with, with um, a little bit higher prices for their program, but they cannot deal with prices that, that with costs for a program that vary all over the map. That's what their budgets cannot deal with. Finally, the most one of the other really important nationwide strategies to resolve the issue is carbon strategies. Either carbon tax or cap and trade would make it so that energy, that polluting and businesses that have high energy usage pay extra for all those kilowatt hours used, a big, a big premium based on that carbon that, that, uh, that pollutes. Recycling a material means you spend a lot less energy getting that material to, you know, to uh, uh, paper, to, you know, that can be used as an in, uh, input, to um, aluminum that can be used as an input, then going from, you know, mining to bauxite to whatever, to whatever, to, to those cans. There would be an automatic huge tax on bringing things from virgin to the market as opposed to recycled to the market. And that would mean 
a game changer for recycling with recycling um, products being preferred, uh, recycling material being preferred on the marketplace immediately and having a big price differential or premium. Which of these long-term strategies do you think might be the most important for recycling? And the answer is EPR, commodity trading, and less so for trusted bales and less yet for the somewhat next, next level of uh, carbon market. Thank you, really interesting feedback. Okay. Summary. The core questions, what can be done to get cleaner materials? Well, it's a mix of multiple strategies, starting at the curb, including education, provi and providing incentives for MRFs to produce cleaner materials. MRFs can clean single stream or dual stream materials if they are able to have the right equipment in, they're able to slow it down, make it a single level and so on, but that MRF incentive can't happen unless there's a price incentive to do so. What makes sense to recycle, collecting and processing? Well, it's not a question single stream, dual stream. It's single stream can work, dual stream can fit in, you know, with maybe a really good fit for small places serviced by smaller uh, MRFs and that can make that, um, and that's the whole system of cost from collection to processing and collection to processing becomes um, much uh, very similar for smaller plants and for, and for larger plants so they can afford that cleanup equipment. You know, split carts are another possible option. It allows for separation, but doesn't require two, two pass-bys in some cases. And that might be another option. It's just there aren't very many split cart systems out there. So I'm nervous to say it's a win-win, but it's something worth looking at. And you might talk to the folks who have those programs. For processing, advances in equipment can clean materials well, as long as the depth is small and the speed is reasonable. Um, as I mentioned, not as economical in small MRFs to have that extra stuff. So dual stream may be suitable for places served by small MRFs. The materials, five of them in our modeling, five of our, our MRF modeling work show, uh, our MRF modeling work shows that five materials have processing costs, attributable processing costs that are higher than the revenues they get per ton. Glass, newspaper, mixed paper, aseptic, and three through seven except for polypropylene. Glass has the lowest price dif cost differential. Aseptic has the highest um, between cost versus revenue. Um, there, it's but the, but you need to figure out you know which things you care about because it's not only about cost. It's not only about tons, but it's about what's going to mess up processing elsewhere. Are there you know are there greenhouse gas things that you care about as part of whether a material is going to be highly valuable for your goals and so on. So there are some criteria and they're discussed in the in the report. And should we show you some. Uh, of what does better and what does a little bit worse. And finally, is there a sustainable recycling structure? Well, it is best if you have, uh, we will get to a best system if we have some moderate and larger changes at the state and, na and national level. EPR, trading on the boards of trade, bail grading and carbon, all would make a very sustainable recycling structure. And even some of those would make a very sustainable recycling structure as well. So I think that th those are some of the options. Recycling was looking like trash. It's a fragmented industry that makes everything really difficult. We give action activities for each of those fragmented sections, but we also talk about that larger state uh, level of cross-sector, cross-actor incentives as well. Uh, there are strategies that uh, uh, that uh, review at each step, and we've given some rankings and and so on for those strategies. And the bottom line is to also keep moving forward and sharing lessons. Those seven strategies in 40 groups are provided in this report. We expect the report will be out in maybe uh, six weeks or so. And um, they we just watch for it. It'll be on our website and EREFs as well. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Dr. Lisa and, and uh, Ann Vanderleet. We really appreciate that. And if there's some questions, let's go back to the chat section. If any of you have some questions in chat that we missed, uh, anybody else? Um, there was so much good information there. There really was education, 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 and I really like those oops little tags. That's it. I, I, my town doesn't have a curbside. We have drop off, so that was completely foreign to me. But uh, I can see where that works. Anybody else have some questions? Want to raise a hand? We'll give everybody plenty of time there. Well, thank you indeed for that presentation. Wait, Sarah says, 
Lisa and Anna's presentation was enlightening. Thank you so much for sharing your research and strategies with us. I'm hopeful that this sharing this information with many uh, of the decision makers representing Oklahoma that are in attendance today can lead to improvements here in our state. And a lot of thank yous showing up in, in, the, in the chat as well. Oh, question. Big picture forecasting. What's the next big thing in processing? Thank you, Michael. Um, Ann, I'll turn that one over to you because you were heavily involved in the processing. Yes, yeah, so from our modeling results, um, which I think might be kind of what you're asking as far as forecasting goes, um, most, especially for non-bottle bill states, because we did look at the difference between a bottle bill state and a non-bottle bill state. For a non-bottle bill state, the most affecting processing strategy is on the, the pre-sort line. So uh, metering bins and augers on that pre-sort line are really important because that kind of sets the tone for the rest of the MRF. Uh, a couple other strategies that scored really well are um, a lot of the robot ones, uh, just because you get a pretty big payout for, I don't want to say a, a less expensive piece of equipment, but compared to an optical sorter, robots are much more affordable. So pre-sort and robots are right now what's looking like the big next thing. And, and I think the uh, robots okay. one is important also because it, it helps with some of the labor issues that people are having. They're having trouble keeping yeah. their facilities staffed. And uh, so. That makes perfect sense. Uh, the next question was, what's the next big thing in uh, uh, collections? Sure. And I think, you know, the, the historical debate has been single stream, dual stream. And for dual stream, do you collect, you know, do you go around twice or do you do it at once and all that sort of stuff. But I think that the next, the next thing worth looking at is maybe to, to look at split cards. And, you know, I've been historically a little bit skeptical of it because I, I always heard things about, you know, when you dumped them, that it would drift from one side to the other and, and things like that. But I think that they're getting better. And I think it might be worth a look-see because to get to get two separated materials with one collection, that's really what, what single stream has been trying to do. And uh, it, it may be that, um, that that may be a way to go. And it's, you know, kind of deals with the issue of being equally convenient for the people. They don't have to go to two separate carts. It's still the same cart, just, you know, put the right thing in the right side. So I think that might be the next thing worth, worth doing. And I think electric truck, truck says in each chat is also something uh, may not help with contamination, but it can help with a lot of other things. So. Indeed. Okay. Okra will be on the lookout for your report and I'll send out a notice on our listserv to let everybody know that it's ready and they can go to your website and read it. Terrific, it's good. Feel free to send any questions. There was one more for you, Lisa. Are you still involved in NRC and should Oklahoma be more involved? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and yes, I am still involved in NRC and I'll make two refinements on that. So one, I'm also the chair so I, I run a, a tight meeting and, and we get a lot accomplished in our meetings and, and uh, hear from everybody, which is something I thought was really important. So everybody on the board uh, contributes and we hear about what's happening all over the country, which is really important for our, for our mission. I'm also still chair of the awards program and I would really love to see some submittals from Oklahoma. And you know maybe, you did you have an awards program? Did you give some out the other day maybe? If you, if you didn't, you should have one, but also if there are outstanding programs or people in the state, we wanna hear about them and just send me an email. And honestly, I will, I will ping them and say, hey, submit something or um, whatever. If, if, if it's, I don't want that to be a barrier. We would really like to have it. And the deadline is actually about a week from now or a week and a half from now. So get me some names, I would love it. And yes, Oklahoma should be more involved, absolutely. I think NRC has a lot of, a lot of things they have a, a database of, of uh, um, recycling reports. And I know Michael was involved in some of the early work to put some of that together. So thank you. And that's been enhanced uh, lately and uh, very searchable and all that sort of stuff. NRC is having some conferences coming up. And I think the networking opportunities and the educational opportunities that NRC gives is, is really important. Unfortunately, we are just about at the end of our conference, but do not, uh, don't leave yet, please, because uh, after uh, I have my, my ending remarks, we have a $100 gift card at the end, so hang on, please. We'd like to thank Kara Burst and the Chickasaw Nation Department of Commerce for producing the conference and providing so much support. Specifically, we'd like to thank Jared Presley, Creative Director, BC3 for Chickasaw Nation Department of Commerce for being the technical director of this show. Big thank you, Jared. And let's see. 
and uh, the, for the conference, their staff, for the, uh, the photography, design work, and all of that. We would also like to thank the Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality, providing the funding to Oprah to put on educational and network events like this. We want to recognize the Okra Conference Committee. Uh, of course, Ellen Bussard is our chair, Kara Burst, Ilda Hershey, Tracy Horst, Sarah Ivey, Trudy Logan, Amanda Schofield, Brett Scoville, Garmin Smith, and myself, Megan Waters. We'd like to thank our conference sponsors one more time, please. Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality, Chickasaw Nation, CDR Global, Roto Chopper, Choctaw Nation, OSU Cooperative Extension Services, American Waste Control, Cox Communication, Indian Nations Chapter, SWANA, Keep Oklahoma Beautiful, Oklahoma Green Schools Program, Natural Evolution, Pinpoint Wire Technology, Ripple Glass, Sierra Container Group, City of Stillwater, City of Tulsa, IPL, McNeilis, Smurfit Kappa North America, and Waste Kip Waste Quip Toter. Did we get everybody in? I believe so. And to our supporters, Oklahoma Compost and Sustainability Association, and of course, Reasers. Thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters, indeed. We hope you'll take the time to complete the short conference evaluation. You can find the link in the evaluation in the chat. Ellen will be putting that in there for us right now, and we'll be sending it out to you as well. One last poll. Please vote on the lunch and learn topics for the next year. All right, those are coming up. These are some lunch and learn topics that we are uh, offering soon, and uh, we want to see what you're most interested in. Put it in the chat. Believe that would be Megan, uh, we had a little technical blurb on my part. Uh -oh. So what I would like people to do is to email Okra and let us know what you would like the Lunch and Learn to, to be about. I see a waste audit of recycling bins in our future. And hopefully after being at this conference for the past couple of days, you have some other ideas of things that you'd like to talk about. So instead of a poll, just email us at okra info at recycleok.org or put it in the chat right now. Just that's a better idea. Just pop a question or pop, pop a topic in the chat and I will be able to, to pick that up and I'll send it to Sarah Ivey in our uh, education and outreach committee. And we'll have some good topics for lunch and learn. Our lunch and learns are really great. Need to put a plug in for them. Very informative, uh, a great way to learn about a subject and uh, just, to, just to find out more easily. Folks are putting them in the chat for us right now. I appreciate that. We've had some great ones on glass. I remember that one. Uh, we've had some good conversation we have with our lunch and learns. And they're quick and easy too. All right, while you continue to put those in chat and think about them, something like being here right now makes it easier to come up with ideas, doesn't it? So we said, thank you, we've done that. Now the drawing for the $100 gift card. And let's see. Patrick Ivy, are you still with us? Patrick Ivy, are you still here today? You have to be present to win. Give you five more seconds, Patrick Ivy. Uh, speak up or say hey in chat. See, this is why you don't want to go away yet. Yep, he's not here. Okay, then Amanda Kidman. Amanda Kidman, are you still with us? It's Kilman, but yes, I am. I'm sorry about that. That's well, okay. Excellent. Ellen will be getting in contact with you and you will get your $100 uh, gift card. Thank you. That is fantastic. All right, then. Thank you, everyone, so much. Oh, Lisa had something to share for us real quick. We'll look in the chat and get that. Dr. Lisa said, I should have mentioned that split carts require a couple things, split trucks and preferably a single destination, although two destinations can happen. Okay, makes sense. Thank you all again. Finally, Megan, we want to thank you for being the most flexible host and MC ever. Uh, we're sorry that you had Wi-Fi problems yesterday, but you handled it just beautifully. And thank you for doing such a fine job for gluing this whole conference together. You were awesome. Hey, thank you all for having to put up with it yesterday. We appreciate uh, uh, everybody understands that. And it's still 
iffy, but I've managed to find a location for us anyway. Uh, Ellen, always thank you. You keep us all calm. You think it's keep us looking good. Absolutely. So thank everyone for participating. Again, all the presenters, all how to get hold of all of us Okra board members, how to get hold of Okra anytime is mentioned in your program. Don't lose that, uh, uh, that attachment. And uh, so you can get hold of any of us anytime you want to. So wow, a lot of information two days, no kidding. We hope that it will encourage and inspire you to help Oklahoma's recycling program. We hope you will take advantage of our lunch and learn sessions as they will be coming up on Facebook in the future, uh, as, our, as well as our Facebook live events in the future. Thank you all and have a great Thursday.